everybody. Welcome back to episode 169 nice. of, <laughs> of the Guardian Project podcast. I'm your host, Andy. And Mike, I had no idea Warhammer 40 key cards would be based on petty theft. Oh. They printed cards that steal genes. <laughs> That's true. It is capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, Hollister has no chance against <laughs> the, the gene stealer cult that is coming. Coles. You guys need to watch out. Yeah. It's not Gene Steeler Coles. It's Gene Steeler Cult, for the record. Cult, not Coles. <laughs> not Coles. Or Target. <laughs> <laughs> if you work in theft, uh, what what is it? The, uh, the security people. I have security. I no, no I mean, I it's security, but there's like... There's theft a, prevention? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where you, you just watch like, out for the, the for people, Warhammer 40K The creatures. people that stalk people through stores that are known thieves or whatever. I had a friend that did that. Was a thief or stalked? The no, thieves? they were they stalked people in in stores and everything. So did they work at a furniture store? Because that's how those are. Oh yeah, maybe. I've derailed this. I've derailed this. <laughs> and I'm your other host, Mike, and I'm very much looking forward to all the new legendary creatures coming from the upcoming Warhammer Extended Universe set. I can't wait to play with all forty thousand new cards. That'd be a lot, actually. That'd be pretty crazy if there, there were 40,000. There, there is 42 per deck, though. Yeah, it's a lot. It's of a lot cards. of new cards. It's a lot of new cards. Please listen carefully. And this is the podcast about Commander. Our favorite Magic the Gathering format. So we finally got our hands on all of our Dominary United product. Did mm -hmm. you open anything fun? I opened a lot of the cards that we talked about uh, two weeks ago uh, when upgrading decks and stuff. Yeah. Um, but nothing like super awesome like no phyrexian text shield or anything i only opened a set booster box though and, oh, okay and then a uh, a bundle because i'm a collector did you of get the that Jumbos. emperor mihail i want that merfolk so bad the set booster exclusive oh i didn't maybe. open that but i did get two plaza of heroes oh nice and i felt like a winner that's i mean it's pretty good it's, card. i think it's i think it's my favorite card from the set that's your favorite card from the whole set it goes in everything i like shield i quite wish a i bit. had more i lost a shield just on uh on arena just the other day that yeah, card I bet. Was, yeah it's really good i had to use my removal on it but it was it was too late they yeah. had a flyer it was, just, it was really it was really bad <laughs> but have you also played against any new dominary united commanders or have you played any of the new dominary united commanders i have not played any i've been watching a lot of arena content so i'm seeing the set from the inside side out that way but i have not played any commander with or against any of the new commanders from dominaria united have you i played hazazon oh, shaper yeah. of sand at the lgs last week um i have i saw at a different table the new joda so okay somewhere was it was someone was talking oh you know what? i did play against the new joda oh you have on a okay. stream on thursday oh you were on a stream oh that's right i yes. did see you on that stream and the new joda I missed the beginning of that stream, and mm -hmm. I remember they were talking about like a. Did they are they shuffling random legendaries in, or is it yes? A, okay, so it's like a hundred and twenty card stack or something, and you shuffle in thirty of them, and that's oh. that's the deck. That that's reminds random. me a lot of the the original Volo deck we did a deck tech yes, on. It is um, here. I I really like that idea. It is, it, and it's and it wasn't like a curated list or anything. It was just a pile of binder cards pile of binder the one that you played creatures. against the one i played against that's yeah. great yeah that's fun. really fun that's fun. really fun um the one announcement that we do have this week is that the uh commander rules committee has two new members olivia gobert hicks and jim lepage it says Ooh. after multiple rounds of interviews with fantastic candidates olivia and jim demonstrated a deep understanding of the commander philosophy the right outlook for successfully managing the format and a bunch of great ideas um that that they were looking forward to so um olivia we I mean, we've seen her stream for forever. forever. Her stream's so good. Mm -hmm. And Jim from the Spike Feeders. So Jim's been on our stream before. Yes, yes. Two wonderful people. So congratulations to them on on that addition um, or or being the additions to the to the rules committee. Yeah, congratulations. Um, but before we continue, because we got a pretty jam packed episode yeah, this we week, do. which is funny that we're getting into it so quickly this week. Um, if you are listening to us every single week, we want to thank you. Um, and especially all of our patrons, we would not be here without you. And if you are looking to support us, you can head to patreon.com slash guardian project pod and donate for any dollar amount. Yes. And there's so many other ways you can support the podcast, whatever platform you are listening or watching the podcast on now, if you could like rate review, subscribe, leave comments. Um, and even in addition to that, you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. You can Google us. Um, and in fact, you can even email us at guardian project pod 
at gmail.com. Mike, what are we talking about this week? Uh, this week, we're going to talk about a little bit of the lore from the legends from Dominaria United. So uh, this is one of the few times that we're actually going to take a third shot at, at a set. So much in this set. It we really felt is. like if we missed it, we'd be really doing it a big disservice. Exactly. And, and you know, I, I'm sure... Um, you know, I, I've only been playing Magic for maybe like five years, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have been playing even less that don't know any of the lore of the original Dominaria or any of these characters, really. So we're going to go and deep dive a little bit um, into the lore of a lot of these legendary characters and Dominaria United, and we're going to talk about a few cards that you could include in their decks. All right, it's story time. So let's take a look at the, there's like a brief synopsis. And if you want to take a, re, a look at the article or share it later, we'll post it in the show notes below. But they have uh, uh, posted, they, as in wizards, mm -hmm. has published a, a an article that gives you a little bit of lore into each of these characters. We're going to read their, their little blip, and then we're going to talk about what the card is, and then maybe how we would build a deck and maybe a theme or even a few cards. The first one is Aaron Benalia's Ruin. So it says, Aaron Capuchin was head of one of the most respective houses in Benalia and a distant relative of the hero Gerard Capuchin until he was captured by the Phyrexians. His completion was personally overseen by Urtai, who sought to use him as a walking, talking reminder of the inevitability of new Phyrexia's triumph. So not a whole lot there, but Aaron is a 3-3 Phyrexian human uh, for white, white, black. It has menace and has pay white and a black, tap it, sack another creature, put a plus and plus encounter on each creature you control. So we're probably just going to lean pretty heavily into a generic white, black, uh, aristocrats theme. Uh, we've seen it before. I might throw this into a Tesa Karlov deck, Tesa Orzov Scion. I'm not sure I'd want to run this as the commander, but I think that's pretty much on the right track. Maybe if you're in your something that's making a bunch of tokens to make them larger. Yeah. And maybe you want to go into proliferate strategies or something because maybe you only want to sacrifice one creature for plus one plus one counters on everything. Um, there are some outlast creatures that you can play that will give benefits to any of your creatures that have plus one plus one counters, like Abzan Falcon Falconer. Uh, two and a white, all your creatures with plus one, plus one counters on it have flying. Yeah. Uh, so maybe something like that would be something you want to do. For sure. That. Next up, we have Aster, Bearer of Blades. So Aster is an ancient Dominarian hero and Keldon warlord who fought in the previous Phyrexian invasion. Aster earned countless titles for his bravery and aptitude throughout the invasion and is one of the most lauded warriors in history. It is said that his tomb is empty because he never died, and rumors of his death were indeed exaggerated. Aster was lived. Aster has lived in a dreamlike state aboard the Golden Argosy for centuries and remains physically as he was when he boarded the ship in his mid twenties. Fully returned to his senses, Aster is ready to battle his old foes once more. He is surprised. He was surprised to find his granddaughter now rules a united Keldon kingdom. So that's Rada. Um, so Aster, Bearer of Blades, is a 4-4 uh, four, four human warrior for two, a red, and a white. This is when Aster, Bearer of Blades, enters the battlefield. Look at the top seven cards of your library. You may reveal an equipment or vehicle card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest of the bottom of your library in a random order. It also has equipments you control have equip for one, and vehicles you control have crew one. I don't, you know, we talked about on the show, I'm not a huge fan of Boros equipment, which is just kind of how I feel that this turned out. But I do like the the vehicle theme. However, I'm partial to Depala Pilot Exemplar. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, we've seen, I mean, you, you used to have a Mono White Adric Lunark Marshall. It's the only vehicles, way to play vehicles. Vehicles deck. So maybe you can add a couple of cool equipment um, here, like the Reaver Cleaver, which combos with a lot of stuff. So maybe you can combo out in this. Um, I'm not sure I'd build this as a commander either. Yeah, I mean, maybe cards like Cauldra Complete. Um, I know it comes in with a germ, and that's really the aspect of it, but it has a really high equip cost of like seven. Yeah. So maybe cheating things like that could be pretty cool. Sure. Next, we have Baird, our Givian recruiter. Baird is one of New Argive's stewards charged with keeping watch over threats to the nation. He was first among uh, those to call for investigations into the possibility of the Phyrexian menace. Now his homeland's darkest hour, Baird has sworn allegiance to the coalition. So Baird is a 2-2 human soldier for a red and a white. I do like 
legendary creatures that only cost two. Mm -hmm. Big upside there. It says at the beginning of your end step, if you control a creature with power greater than its base power, create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. So you're playing tokens, which I like. And I, I, I did look into this one. So I, I like the idea of playing lords because they're just giving your creatures plus one, plus one, mm -hmm. which is bigger than their base power as printed. So you're going to just keep making tokens at the beginning of your end step is it only your end step or yeah it is only your end yeah step. only your end step so um i mean you can play annoying a procession yeah you're gonna make two then because you're already in white and, and baird's only two mana so i think that's very fair like it's not making one token every single turn for two mana is or it secure like the i think secure the wastes is the mm. white and an x and you make a bunch of tokens or soldiers or something but if you're just running things that are giving plus one plus one it's bigger than what's printed so you're just you're getting double the power and toughness of what you're i think secure the waste does something very uh similar martial coup might be the one that you're thinking of though that does create x one one white soldier creature tokens if x is five or more destroy all other creatures yeah this one is actually just an instant for white and x you get x warrior tokens. oh there you go so play them both, both. play them both <laughs> All right, next we have one that I think is a little bit closer to your play style than my play style, Andy. And I base it off of one deck that you have, but Balmor, Battle Mage Captain. Uh, Balmor is New Argive's Captain of the Guard and leader of the Avon Battle Mage Regiment known as the Fire Feathers. Before coming to Argivia, Balmor studied at Talarian Academies across Dominaria. I didn't know that. I thought there was only one Talarian Academy. There's a bunch. Um, an accomplished soldier and a genius tactician, Balmor is willing to enact daring and brilliant maneuvers in defense of the city he calls home. So Balmor is a 1-3 bird wizard for a blue and a red with flying. This is whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, creatures you control get plus one plus oh and gain trample until end of turn. I This reminds me of Adelaide's the Cinderwind, which mm -hmm. you, you play with wizards. So whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, wizards get plus one plus one. I like this one even more because if you're already playing with wizards, well, maybe their toughness being pumped does matter here, but this gives trample, which mm -hmm. is pretty cool. I put Balmore into Adelaide's. I honestly, I put them both there. This is a bird wizard and Ad Adelaide's is a human wizard. So mm -hmm. they work together. I just like spell singer decks with a bunch of tokens. Yeah. This is going to do. This would be a very, very fantastic budget deck. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, uh, I don't play these decks very often, so I don't have much insight. Uh, Brainstorm, you can play Brainstorm in here, and you then can play get, Ponder. You get all the card draw spells are also pumping your creatures. That's that's the advice I have to give. Perfect. <laughs> Next is a Baru Worm Speaker. Baru is a druid from the Forest of Croza who seeks to follow in the footsteps of the le legendary barbarian and hero Kamal. While Croza was devastated by one of Dominaria's many apocalypses, Baru and his fellow druids work diligently to restore the region and to return the forest to its former glory. The fruits of their labor have begun to arrive, most recently in the form of mighty worms who have returned to hunt under Croza's shady boughs. I've heard that worms are really good if they're in your garden. So like if you have worms, it means that you've done the right thing in like a garden. So right. makes if, sense. If you have worms in your body, you have not done the right thing to cultivate that garden. Do not. Yeah, that's that's not. I'm not thrilled with that no. idea at all. <laughs> Gross. So borrow worm speakers, a three, three human druid for two green, green. It says worms you control get plus two, plus two and have trample and has an activated ability of seven and a green. Tap it, create a four, four green worm. This ability costs X less to activate where X is the greatest power among worms you control. Most worms are disgusting and gross and big mm -hmm. in magic. And so that, that ability is going to get reduced a lot. Um, you here are just playing Worm Tribal. May I suggest uh, Impervious Great Worm, the sure. biggest creature ever printed, being a 16-16 face value. Nice. Um, it does also have Convoke, so I guess you could do that. I like the idea of playing like Thousand Year Elixir and untapping Borrow Worm Speaker and just That's making a cool. bunch of worms. That's what I would want to do. Um, playing Palaka Worm, uh, or especially Panglacial Worm, which says when you're searching your library, you may play Panglacial <laughs> Worm from your library. As long as you have the mana, you do have to cast it still. you do have to spend seven but you're in green so you i mean probably can. what what are you looking for i really like sandworm convergence for this deck an enchantment from amonkhet that prevents creatures with flying from attacking you and creates uh free worm tokens and of course um worm coil engine is also a worm I finally got to put an extra copy of it when I was pulling cards to try to put this deck together. I was mm -hmm. like, hey, I have a deck for Worm Coil Engine. Now. It's perfect. It's <laughs> perfect. All right. So Blade Wing Deathless Tyrant um, is uh, a creature we did talk about in the combo episode a little bit. Um, so it, we'll just give the quick blurb here of Blade Wing's lore. So many years ago, the dragon Rorix Blade Wing was slayed 
slain in a fruitless pursuit of honor. Resurrected through a long-forgotten means, the undead Rorix has terrorized the skies of Otaria for centuries. His descendants Varix and Karox mourn his pitiful existence and are prepared to take down their ancestor for good. I read this, and that is the saddest thing. These two people just pity its existence mm-hmm. entirely. It's not supposed to be alive. It probably doesn't want to be alive. So, yeah. We got a big black red dragon, a 6-6. Six, six. It, it does dragon things. So if you didn't listen to our last episode, check that out for some combos. Mm-hmm. But it makes zombies whenever it attacks. Yes. Based uh, on, based on creatures, in creatures in your graveyard. graveyard. Yeah. So, you know, throw some things into your graveyard. Re- maybe You know what? That's a place to play reanimating, uh, re- uh, reanimating skeleton. I just love oh, that card so much. Play skeleton tribal. You can do that because Bladewing is a skeleton. I don't know how many skeletons we have, but... And it doesn't make skeletons. It makes zombie It just makes zombies. Knights. It yeah. makes zombie knights. Uh, people were talking about that in our Discord just the other day, mm-hmm. and I didn't realize how many zombies and uh, there... I don't know why I say I don't realize how many zombies there are, but that work really well with this commander. Oh, And sure. it's not just like zombie lord tribal like will help. It's mm-hmm. very much the odd zombies. Sure, like the like the ones that grant... <clears throat> there's ones that grant specifically uh, keywords to zombie tokens that were printed in the uh, War of the Spark uh, section. I don't know how many of them fit in Rakdos, but at least there's some mono black ones that give death touch and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah definitely. Next is Boar Tuck Bone Rattle. And I practice that. Nice. Uh, Boar Tuck Bone Rattle is one of Dominaria's last trolls. A naturally gifted necromancer, he seeks a path to true resurrection, not for himself, but for his nearly extinct species. To this end, he has no qualms about using the bodies that populate his swamp as servants and guardians. So uh, Bortok Bone Rattle is a 4-4 four, four for 4, a black and a green, 6 mana total. It's a troll shaman with domain. When it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, choose target creature in your graveyard. Return that card to the battlefield. If its mana value is equal to or less than the number of basic land types among all lands you control. Otherwise, put it into your hand. So if you're playing this as your commander you're you're only going to be able to get two basic land types at most so the card's likely going to come back to your hand unless you're playing a bunch of small creatures which i don't know maybe if you're doing that you could throw this into like a marin deck it's a little high mana value but i feel like they're trying to do something similar here um i like it and it's also you can play some troll cards if you wanted to play um some tribal synergies because we've already got some trolls that are in black and green that throw things into the graveyard I wasn't sure if you were talking about nefarious ways to play magic, and that's what you meant by troll cards. Like, you, you're like, ha ha ha, gotcha. No, troll. no, I'm actually, uh, I'm, uh, it's the good trolls. <laughs> I think there is a green enchantment uh, that you could put on a land that gives you uh, all basic land types. Um, but that would be like the only way to get around the two basic land type. You have uh, Urborg and Yavi Maya now, if you are outside of those two particular colors because they don't have a color identity. You can play them in your domain decks and get a little bit more domain that way. Not the case for Bortuk Bone Rattle. Uh, my favorite, my favorite, my favorite Dominaria legendary is this next one. Um, this is Braids, Risen from Nightmare. Uh, Braids, uh, centuries ago, Braids was a powerful mage for the Cabal until a near-death experience left her trapped in dementia space. There, she was trapped, torn apart again and again by her own nightmares until a desperate conclave of Cabal summoners performed a ritual to drag her back to Dominaria and unfortunately blowing up all their heads in the process. Now, she intends to lead her followers into a new golden age if she can get them to lighten up a little bit. Uh, So this is Braid's Arisen Nightmare, uh, a Nightmare 3-3 for one black black. This is the beginning of your end step. You may sacrifice an artifact, creature, enchantment, land, or planeswalker. If you do, each opponent may sacrifice a permanent that shares a card type with it. For each opponent who who doesn't, that player loses two life and you get to draw a card. It's a pretty good card. I think I, so in, I opened three boxes. Okay. I opened five braids. Nice. I don't, I didn't need five. Oh. One, one would have been. You one, could probably one. find a place for all five. No, one would have been <laughs> fine. I, I think it's just another mono black, like value commander. That's just going to do a little bit over time. Uh, it does say each opponent may, mm-hmm. so they don't have to. Right. It, but if they don't, they lose two life and you get to draw a card. So that is card advantage. Mm-hmm. So just playing out a bunch of things that are going to make you creature tokens. Um, you could just, honestly, if you already have a mono black commander, I feel like you could probably just slot this in and it'd still just be fun. You definitely can. I, I would particularly try to try to slot in an Ophiomancer in here because Ophiomancer makes a snake, a one, one black snake creature token at every upkeep 
uh, if you don't already control a snake. Yes. Next is Cadric Soul Kindler. So Cadric is a dwarven echo mage who makes magical copies of living beings to fight alongside him. Gripped by curiosity from a young age, Cadric has devoted his life to discovering the source of a mysterious frequency deep beneath the Carplusian Mountains. He believes that Dominaria's first song is entombed deep underground, resonating toward the surface through the veins of rare magical ore. I, this reminds me of Pokemon Legends Arceus because you had to go around on a bear. It's the new Ursaring creature. Okay. Uh, the, the evolution, it's not Ursaring. Oh, I wish I knew the actual name, but you had to like dig up verses. And that's okay. all I could think was because the songs were underground. Uh, so uh, Kadrick is a 4-3 dwarf wizard for two white red. And it says the legend rule doesn't apply to tokens you control. Mm -hmm. And whenever another non-token legendary permanent enters the battlefield under your control, you can pay one generic if you do create a token that's a copy of it the token gains haste and sack it at the beginning of the next end step i am surprised i haven't seen many people talk about this this card a lot it works with everything you want to do in commander you can make tokens of just big white and 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 red creatures mm -hmm. like a you know, a Tali Primal Storm, which is going to just give you card advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like the idea of Atsushi, the Blazing Sky here. It, it's this is this is red white legendaries. Yeah, red white legendaries that either have attack triggers or death triggers or yeah, ETB triggers. ETB triggers. <laughs> so it it all works pretty well. It, in fact, this was one that we didn't get a chance to talk about the combo last week. Um, if you want to go over to Commander Spellbook and look up Cadric, you will find uh, a, a Gerard Weatherlight Captain and Phyrexian Altar combo over nice. there. Nice. Very cool stuff. All right. So a character, a returning character uh, here. Well, I guess a lot of these have been returning characters. We have uh, Danitha Benali as Hope. So Danitha, heir of House Capuchin, is a brave and brash knight who can always be found at the front of a melee. Trained from a young age in both diplomacy, dip, diplomacy and swordplay, Danitha has taken over command of the knights once loyal to her fallen father. Now she fights not just for Benalia, but Dominaria. Um, and this is a card that we did talk about in the combos episode as, as well. Um, a five mana, four, four human knight that has an ETB to either put an aura equipment from your graveyard or your hand onto the battlefield attached to Danitha. Yeah, first strike, vigilance, lifelink. It's, really good. good it's keywords. just it's got all the good keywords on the card. Mm -hmm. Next is Dihada, Binder of Wills, which is, is another creature that we are seeing for a second time. Uh, Gaeadrone Dihada is an incredibly ancient demonic planeswalker. Her schemes span a millennia, and her lust for power and dominance know no limits. In the past, she sought to control worlds uh, that she she visits by corrupted proxies such as uh, Solkanar or Dakon Blackblade. Dihada left Dominaria at um, at the uh, close of the, the Planeswalker War, and she believes she still lives uh, through greatly diminished since the mending, um, or some believe that she still lives. Right. Uh, and others say that even now she pulls the strings behind some of the greatest political powers in Dominaria. Uh, so this is a Planeswalker commander. This is the face face commander of the, the legendary deck. Um, we talked about her on the combo episode with a couple of, of infinite mills. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to check that on commanderspellbook.com, you can do that as well. Um, it's just a lot of really fun stuff to throw creatures in your mm -hmm. graveyard, draw cards, make treasures uh, I mean, is what you're going to do in, in the deck. So solid commander, one that I actually do want to upgrade. I am surprised that it doesn't have a little uh, excerpt for the read more about uh, Dihada because she does actually show up in one of the side stories. So make sure you read all the stories and see if you can find Dihada. Uh, Ellis Ilcor, Sadistic Pilgrim, is our next one. One that I said uh, when I saw the art for it, this better have a card. And I sent it to our group chat. So Ellis Ilcor, an outcast from her people. Ellis Ilcor was exploring an ancient Rothy ruin when she discovered an urn of glistening oil deep in one of the subterranean tombs. One touch and she was assailed with visions of the arrival of the Phyrexian Praetor Shaldred. With the whispers of her new master in her ear and the corruption of the oil surging through her, Ellis sought out Shildred and pledged loyalty everlasting. So for a white and a black, you get a Phyrexian Core Cleric 2-2 with Death Touch. It says whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. And whenever another creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life. Black white aristocrats, kind of like Astor. It is. I am participating in the cut series on Commander's Herald. So in a couple of weeks, head over there and check it out. Vote if you like my deck. But I put together a full build that is pioneer legal mm -hmm. with at least eight legendaries. So I'm not trying okay. to spoil the whole article, but um, 
I really like the idea of Archangel of Thune for life gain because mm-hmm. you're going to do that. All the the white and black Theros gods are really great. Both Heliods, both Erebos are fantastic here. A- and then anything that can just gain you life and drain life. Even if it's just one of those generic creatures that being of your upkeep gain to life, mm-hmm. you, you're already playing life gain synergies that it, it works. Sure. You can build it on a budget. <laughs> <laughs> and with only... Uh, uh pioneer legal cards yeah yeah so if you started playing just in the last couple of years mm-hmm. you've got i didn't even realize how many of those cards that go in uh, aristocrat decks are just from the last like six years mm-hmm. uh next is emperor mihail the second emperor mihail the second is a strong sovereign of vidalia and the ruling cast uh and a ruling cast stavarad who served in the military in his youth uh, a strong leader for his merfolk kindred, Mihal is torn between his desire to right the ills of the world and his fear of punishing or pushing a realm already teetering on the brink of autocracy over the edge. The Phyrexian invasion has only made louder the calls in Mihal's inner circle for control at any cost. So Emperor Mihal II is a 3-3 merfolk noble for one blue blue. It says you can look at the top card of your library at any time. Love it. You may cast merfolk spells from the top of your library. Love it. Whenever you cast a merfolk spell, you can pay one generic. If you do, you make a, a merfolk creature token. Also love that. You're you're building a merfolk tribal deck here. Mm-hmm. All of the merfolk that you have are lords. It feels like all of them because there's so many of them. There are. You just want to play something that's going to give Island Walk. I feel like if you're playing Kumena currently or you put together uh, any of the other merfolk decks, mm-hmm. you could probably just slot Emperor Mihail the second in if you want to play with more For of a token sure. strategy. Yeah, I, I I don't disagree at all. Um, like you said, anything to try to give Island Walk or whatever, that's the way you want to go. Um, Urtai Resurrected. This guy's a bad guy. Uh, once a member of the original Weatherlight crew, the cocky and brash wizard Urtai was Phyrexianized and then killed millennia ago. The wizard was reconstituted by the dark sciences of the Praetor Shieldred. Now, in addition to serving the legions of New Phyrexia, Urtai seeks revenge on those he once considered his friends. Trained in the art of magic at the Telerian Academy, Urtai's resurrection has only strengthened the arcane gifts at his disposal. So Urtai Resurrected is a 3-2 Phyrexian human wizard for two, a blue, and a black with flash. And it has an ETB that you get to choose one of the following. Counter target spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. Its controller draws a card. Or destroy another target creature or planeswalker. Its controller draws a card. Um, so I, I know I'm already slotting this into human decks and everything. It's a pretty good blue-black control commander if you're just doing blue-black control stuff. If you want to blink things, it can enter a bunch That's of times, true. which is cool. And if you wanted to play like Candlekeep Sage, the background, if it's your commander, yeah. you also get to draw cards when it enters or leaves. So that's pretty cool. You, you could end up killing your own creatures if you wanted to with this. It just says another creature. Uh, so you can't kill Urtai itself, but then you can get the card draw from the ability. I also learned that if you give away through like Sudden Substitution, one of those zero cost counter spells, mm-hmm. like the, um, oh gosh, what is it? The Pact, Pact of Negation. Yes. If you give it away to somebody, you can... Um, counter like you can counter things like counter the upkeep if someone gave it to you you can counter upkeep triggers and it's just it's pretty cool nice i i I think it's a fun uh a fun legendary i'm not sure i have a slot for it but it's fun Mm -hmm. next is garna blood fist of keld uh, a vicious warlord from the frozen west of keld garna provided keldons dissatisfied with grand warlord rada's uh, more cosmopolitan rule with another vision of their people, violent, blood-soaked, and triumphant over all who stand in their way. In the wake of the Phyrexian invasion, Garna has agreed to set aside her rivalry with Rada and work together against the interplanar threat for now. For now. Just for now. So Garna is a 4-3 human berserker for one black red red. Whenever another creature you control dies, draw a card if it was attacking. Otherwise, Garna, Blood Fist of Kel, deals one damage to each opponent. So... Um, if creatures die, you're dealing damage to your opponents. If they die when they're attacking, you get to draw a card. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Yeah. Instant speed, sack outlet, swing with everything, take advantage of the attack step not ending until even after damage happens and go to town. In Rakdos, card draw in Rakdos. That's great. (laughs) Green Sleeves Marrow Sorcerer uh, is our delight. Once High Wizard of the Domains and a Planeswalker who sacrificed her spark to heal the land, Greensleeves served Dominaria well in her time. Now, sensing the return of the plane's greatest enemies, Greensleeves has been reborn as the Morrow Sorcerer of the Whispering Woods, a being of pure elemental power. The former Archdruid was sworn to protect not just the people of Dominaria, 
but the land itself. Um, this was a card that we did talk about on our combo episode. Yes. Um, so it does combo with Guild Common. So make sure you listen to our episode. Uh, and Kodama of the of the West Tree. And Kodama Not of the West East Tree. Tree the, the, the one with Partner, the Commander yes. Legends one. Super, super fun card. We also talked about this next card on the combo episode. This is Ify, uh, Ify. Ivy, Gleeful Spell Thief. Uh, Ivy has been a thorn. Actually, did we talk about this in the combo? I think we talked about this on the episode with cards the, we wanted to play. Yes, in my uh, Simic Legendary Yes. Yeah, so Ivy uh, has been a thorn in the side of Telerian administration for many, many years. A mischievous fairy, Ivy's self-stated purpose in life is to keep people humble. Uh, many uh, an overconfident first year has found their spell snatched out of midair with only an irritating giggle left in its place. So Ivy's a 2-1 fairy rogue uh, for green and a blue flying whenever a player casts a spell that targets only a single creature other than ivy uh you can copy it does say may you may copy it and it targets ivy so lightning bolt you don't have to copy you don't have to. um you could but i assume they're gonna target ivy pretty cool <laughs> card and i i hear a lot about people building this yeah yeah i'm excited to see those decks finally make it uh into my vision so that i could watch videos of them jared carthalian didn't think i'd ever say that name again in a standard set uh, well, I guess this card is not from the standard set, but the Carthalians are one of the oldest families in Dominaria. They can trace their ancestry back to the time of legends when their orphaned ancestor was dubbed Carth the Lion by Dakin Blackblade himself. Jared spent his long life battling many foes, most notably the evil planeswalker Ravidel. Toward the end of his adventures, he discovered his own latent planeswalker spark before disappearing for centuries. Now, in Dominaria's time of need, he has returned as an agent of the new coalition, intent on defending his homeland from threats both old and new. Uh, so this Jared Carthalian... Uh, is the planeswalker from the other uh, yes. Dominaria United Painbow. Deck. Five colors! Painbow, we decided, is the best uh, name for any commander. Any precon, it's the only one I'll ever remember because yes. I always just say, you know, the mono white Nahiri deck mm -hmm. or the deck that had Edgar. I don't know the names no. of those. Painbow. Painbow. So Jared Carthalian is all five uh, mana, white, blue, black, red, green, uh, five loyalty, really cares about the number of colors the cards has. Yeah. So it's a plus one to make a, an all color Kavu and then a minus three to put plus one, plus one counters on something equal to the number of colors it has. And it only gets scarier from there. It does. It does only get scary from there next is jensen carthalian druid exile so another carthalian jensen carthalian is a teenaged descendant of jared carthalian and the newest elder druid as a young boy jensen was attacked by dihada's evil foes he was resurrected by a sarah angel and has since incorporated that gratitude into his druidic worship the yabamaya forest is buckling with the return of the phyrexians and jensen is doing everything in his power to calm it so this is a 2-2 human druid for green and a white this is from the the actual pain bow deck it says whenever you cast a multicolored spell scry one if that spell was all colors you also create a Four, four white angel of flying and vigilance and it has pay five tap it to add white blue black red green to your mana pool so if you're playing a multicolor deck this fits really well yeah I, i've seen um actually someone run this as a cedh deck because it is a five color deck that can run loris as your companion so if you're a cdh player and that's something that's interesting wow. yeah right it's pretty great <laughs> All right, so we have Joyra Ageless Innovator, uh, which is another card that we talked about on our combo episode. As a student of Urza's original Telerian Academy, Joyra befriended the future planeswalkers Karn and Teferi, became immortal by accident, and helped create the Weatherlight. After rebuilding the skyship, Joyra handed over the role of captain to Shauna and retired to her workshop at the Mana Rig. When news of the Phyrexian invasion reached her, Joyra brought her formidable intellect and and experience to the coalition and serves now as one of its leaders. Uh, Jorah has always cared about artifacts. One time Jorah cared about historic spells, which also includes artifacts. More artifacts. I like stuff. the middle Joyer the best, and I like this one second. I don't like the original suspend one personally. So it was one of my first decks I built. I'm looking to I'm looking forward to seeing what people do with, with Joyra. Next is Joda the Unifier. Uh at over four thousand years of age, Joda is an Archmage blessed with the uh the prodigious talent and eternal youth um, born during a time when his ancestors war had decimated tertiary joda had spent his life choosing to spread peace together with his lifelong friend jaya ballard they brought together the warring keljoran and balduvian factions against the necromancer limdul resulting in the formation of the nation of argive uh, with the return of the phyrexian threat joda leverages the, his reputation as one of dominaria's greatest heroes to rally allies 
to the coalition's banner. So this is a 5-5. We talked about this briefly, but it's a 5-5 human wizard. You're going to put it into your uh, Morophon humans deck, deck mm -hmm. legendary creatures. It, it's, it's legendary uh, coat of arms. So your legendaries get plus one, plus one for each legendary you have. And then it also has legendary cascade, which is pretty cool. It's so, so strong. I uh, can't wait to play with it. King Darien, extra large, the eighth. Uh, King Darien, I, and only because I don't. There's 40, 48. <laughs> so good. King Darien 48 is the conflicted lord of New Argive. With the emergence of Phyrexian sleeper agents, Darien wanted to withdraw from the world and put up walls until the invasion ran its course. His loyal advisor, Baird, convinced him otherwise, and now he steals himself to face this threat head on. So King Darien uh, the Eighth is a three mana, two, three human soldier for one and a green and a white. It says other creatures you control get plus one, plus one. For a three green and a white, you get to put a plus one, plus one counter on King Darien and create a one, one white soldier creature token. You can then sacrifice King Darien to create, uh, to, to have creature tokens you control gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. This works really well into humans builds. Mm -hmm. I already have a, a, a blue, a green, white humans deck with Sagarda, the middle Sagarda, Heron's Grace. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put this in there. You could also just slot it in if you want to try something new for humans. I'm putting it in my Abzan token stack for sure. Uh, synergizes really well with, um, oh my gosh, I can't think of the name, uh, 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 Cather's Crusade. Oh, for sure. Because you get to put a plus one, plus one, and then create a token that's going to put another plus one, plus one. Let's talk about a Rakdos card real quick that I, a couple, I think a couple of people talked about going, ooh, this is going to be really strong. And it might be. I'm just not sure if anyone's really going to build Lagomos Hand of Hatred. It says, before the summoning of braids from the depths of uh, dementia space, all the stars seem to align uh, and finally elevate Lagomos to his rightful place in charge of the Cabal. He had managed to survive the right, uh, the reign of Bells and Lock before those damn planeswalkers killed him, and he had single-handedly, so he says, stopped the organization from completely crumbling in the demon's absence. Now he takes his orders from a deranged construct of pure fear, which is somehow even worse than the Cabal's previous leadership. While he may grovel and kneel for now, it's nothing more than a temporary situation. When Lagomos' schemes come to fruition, the Cabal will finally be in his hands i actually really think this is going to be a fun creature if we come back and he's like some mythic yeah that'd be fun but it's a one three human shaman for one black red at the beginning of combat on your turn create a two one red elemental creature token with trample and haste sack it at the beginning of the next end step it also has tap search your library for a card um put it into your hand then shuffle activate only if five or more creatures died this turn so you're already making one you have to find a way to make a bunch of other tokens consistently mm -hmm. i don't know how many times you're going to search but it's just a it's just a demonic tutor if you yeah. can sack five creatures and if you can play maybe with micaeus the unhallowed that to give work. them undying and bring them back mm -hmm. or something that when something dies you make a token works really well i like rings of bright hearth here double that activated ability double trigger. it up uh, Maria Scholar of Antiquity is another card that we talked about on our combos episode. Maria is the leader of the elves of Yavimaya and an avid student of Dominaria's history. Unlike most Yavimayan elves, Maria is fascinated by the ancient technology left by the Thran and doesn't hesitate to wield it in Yavimaya's defense. While Maria is young by elven standards, her ingenuity, creativity, and curious approach to the world has proven the salvation of her people time and time again. So this is the Gruul Urza, as we call it now. Gruul Gur Gurza. Yeah. Gruul Gurza. Gurza. This is Gruulza. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, Gruul Artifacts Matter, non-token Artifacts Matter. Uh, you can tap un uh, uh, untapped non-token Artifacts to add green uh, and tap two of them to exile the top card of your library and play it. Yeah, there's some really neat combos. Very, this is a very, very strong so. deck. Next is Moira, Urborg Hunt. And if you don't think of Shit's Creek, I don't know who you are. <laughs> it says, in life, Moira was a powerful necromancer who worked her craft in the marshes of Urborg, binding spirits to her will and forcing them to serve her. When one of her own spells backfired, destroying her mortal form, Moira found herself in the same position as so many of her minions and realized the error of her ways. Now Moira uses her necromantic powers benevolently, helping the newly deceased adjust to their afterlife she firmly believes that no spirit should be enslaved to another's will which often puts her at odds with the lich ratadrabic so this is a three two spirit wizard for two in the black with menace not flying definitely looks like it has flying and it says whenever moira urborg haunt deals damage to a player return to the battlefield target creature in your graveyard that was put there from the battlefield this turn we've seen creatures that do something similar to this um it's fun to play in a deck that's just looking to swing and reanimate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could kill the thing that you swing with, reanimate the thing that you swing with. 
Uh, I like evoke creatures for this too. It reminds me of the black green from, is it War of the Spark? It's one of the, like whoever oh. took over for Gerard. It's it's not. And they have a worm with them. They're like a worm tamer or something in their card art. Crap, I don't remember. But it's it's very reminiscent yes. of that, but this is just mono black. Yes, yes. Uh, Nail Avizoa Aeronaut is our next legendary creature. Nail was always the curious type and her curiosity could not be contained by the borders of Yavimaya. As soon as she came of age, she set off to see the world. In her travels, she noticed a flock of strange creatures floating in the sky. Several failed experiments later, Nail found herself soaring above the clouds, a view of Dominaria few get a chance to appreciate. So you get a 2-4 elf scout for two, a green and a blue with flying that has domain. Whenever Nail, Avian, Arnot deals combat damage to a player, look at the top X cards of your library where X is the number of basic land types among lands you control. Put up to one of them on the top of your library and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Then if there... Uh, Sorry, then if there are five basic land types among lands you control, draw a card. Something you're not going to be able to do unless you run that one particular you could run land. Prisma aura. Prismatic or uh, Omen. So one in a green, lands you control are every basic land type. So yes. that works really well here. Um, or just playing cards that add an additional basic land type. Dryad of the Elysian Grove. Oh, that works. So lands you control every basic land type. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. You could play Urborg. I'm you just can, saying. You can you can play Urborg. Yes. You are correct. Uh, Nayal the Stormrunner. We talked about this on the combo episode as a way to take someone's turn and then just kill them, yeah, I die. guess, with a Wheel of Misfortune. Mm -hmm. But uh, a 5-4, a Freak Wizard for two blue, blue, and a red. You can cast sorcery spells as though they had flash. And whenever Nayal the Stormrunner attacks, you can pay two if you do. Um, when you cast your next instant sorcery this turn, copy it. So it says, from the time... Uh, immemorial, they all claim to be the fastest of free in the infinite expanse of Rabaya, her homeworld. Uh, whenever, when another of her tribe challenged her to a race, Nayal was pushed to her limits when suddenly she was best by a desert and found herself lost in the Tivan Desert. Nayal is not a planeswalker and is unsure whether she could ever recreate this feat, but having run so fast, she crossed dimensional barriers even once affords her enough bragging rights for now, which just reminds me of the show The Flash, where it didn't matter what you do, mm -hmm. all you had to do was run faster. Mm -hmm. You could time travel mm -hmm. get out of the way of weapons mm -hmm. you could go through walls there you go the flash was an irritating show uh, but this imagine. story is fun so there isn't there is a there is a series called the animatrix it's an animated version of the matrix and there is someone that runs so fast that they see the matrix like they <laughs> see the computer stuff that's happening he's like whoa and it's not someone who's like got the red pill or whatever it is it's just he was so fast that he actually I think because the Matrix is about willpower anyways. You you go willpower, a free wizard. <laughs> uh, Namada, a prime, prime evil warden. This is actually the last card that's going in my Abzan deck. I'm looking for a cut for it right now. Namada is a massive uh, Magnagoth tree folk over 3,000 feet tall who has served as the dragon Rith's warden for millennia. Rith's sudden escape has left Namada furious, and he has begun to wake his fellow tree folk to recapture the dragon. So despite being 3,000 feet tall, Namada is a 3-4 creature. Uh, for two, a black and a green, you get a tree folk with reach. It says, I sure hope it had reach, being 3,000 feet tall. If a creature <laughs> an opponent controls would die, exile it instead. When you do, create a 1-1 green sapling creature token. You can pay a green and sacrifice a sapling. Uh, Nomada Primeval Warden gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. And you can pay one and a black and sacrifice two saplings to draw a card. I like that it has whatever a creature and opponent control would die exile instead. That's mm -hmm. really good just having it on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. It's such a fun commander, and it works really well on Slimefoot. Someone suggested I, I run Anafenza the foremost as my Abzan Tokens mm. commander. And I think I like this as in the 99 better than Anafenza at the helm. I I kind of agree. Mm -hmm. I tend to agree. Queen Alanal of Rudok. So uh, thanks to their lifelong lifespan. Uh, lifelong lifespan. It's their long lifespan. Yes. Uh, I mean, their whole lifespan is lifelong. It is lifelong. It's lifelong. Mm -hmm. uh, many elves still remember the last Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria. The half-elf Queen Alanal of the Lanoir Elfim Rudok is one of these. When her mother was killed by the interplanar invaders hundreds of years ago, the young Queen Alanal swore she would take revenge one day. Now that the Phyrexians have turned, she has her chance. So it's a star star elf noble, uh, green, white, white. Her power and toughness are equal to the number of creatures you control. And if one or more creature tokens would be created under your control, you make uh, a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature instead. So if one or more, you instead make soldiers. 
Um, you make you make that many that tokens many plus, plus one soldier. a white soldier. Yes, uh, a one one white soldier. Um, I think we talked about this on the combo episode. It, we did talk about it on the combo episode. I think uh, when it comes to token decks, this one uh, all in all, it would go in. But, yeah, <laughs> that was good. You're welcome. That was good. <laughs> Uh, Rada Coalition Warlord. Grand Warlord uh, Grand Warlord of Keld, the half-elf Rada, set aside old grudges and territorial rivalries to help lead the new coalition against Shieldred's Phyrexians. With the return of her people's ancient enemy, the strength of Keld has never been more direly needed by the people of Dominaria. Uh, so this is an elf warrior 3-3 three, three for two, a red and a green with domain whenever Rada... Uh, coalition warlord becomes tapped another target creature you control gets plus x plus x until end of turn where x is the number of basic land types among lands you control the the prismatic omen seems to fit in any of these domain legendaries yeah, they if they green. that they have green right so it works really well there i like this this new rata and i like the idea of them just they just smash face yeah i i when I look at this in the form of like in sealed or in standard or something, I like it a lot more than in commander because it, you know, without that aura and without playing Urborg or something, it seems like the most you can get is plus two plus two, which doesn't seem uh, like enough to me. Sure. But you know, if you can make it work, make it work, make it work. Uh, Raph Weatherlight Stalwart. So despite being born to nobility, Raph's heart always longed for adventure, which he found by serving as the ship's mage on board the Weatherlight. Since Shieldred's invasion of Dominaria became common knowledge, Raph has helped his crew smuggle valuable information and supplies across Phyrexian-controlled territory. Raph is a gifted illusionist, having previously studied at the Telerian Academy, and in the two years since joining the crew, he has grown into the role of ship's mage, shedding his youthful boasting but not his sense of humor so raf is a one three human wizard for white and a blue i still love these two mana legendaries mm -hmm. uh, it says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery you may tap two untapped creatures you control if you do draw a card and you can pay five mana three white white to give creatures you control plus one plus one and vigilance till end of turn this card has been very fun in draft so far mm -hmm. but i also think this would be a fun budget commander where you're just playing with a bunch of spells that make tokens so yes. make three soldiers and then tap two of your creatures to draw a card and now you have three soldiers and you drew an extra card and then later in the game you can just play uh you can pump as many times as you want so if you can make infinite mana i guess you can give your creatures plus one plus one in vigilance and, and get the win there yeah i mean if you play with something like a, a murmuring mystic or something that does make tokens every time you cast an instant or sorcery and you just so happen to have an anointed procession that doubles your token generation then every single time you cast an instant or sorcery you will have two creatures to tap to draw an extra card yeah great great card i would like to be, i'm this would be a fun dodge build. definitely all right rata drabic of urborg our last of our of our urborg legendary creatures here uh draw new never neural jazu vest all mighty liches and all dead all dead truly dead that is the great radadrabic has outlived them all radadrabic has seen apocalypses come and go from his ramshackle castle in the marshes of urborg he survived would-be heroes a phyrexian invasion and the collapse of time itself there is no remaining necromancer of radadrabic's Radadra caliber on dominaria except perhaps that that meddling spirit speaker Moira, who seems determined to let the many ghosts and ghouls of Urborg run amok rather than serve their rightful master. If Radajabic has his way, he'll be the last great power in Urborg. Seems like a really fun guy. I, I, I seems enjoy, great at parties. I enjoy Radajabic. <laughs> I, I mean, Radajabic will probably enslave me under some necromantic spell, so what choice do I have? Yeah, you built the deck. <laughs> So a 3-3 three, three zombie wizard for two, a white and a black has a vigilance and ward two. Other zombies you control have vigilance. And whenever another legendary creature you control dies, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a non-legendary and it's a 2-2 two, two black zombie in addition to its other colors and types. Um, really like, I mean, black, white, reanimator, aristocrats style kind of deck. Um, I think like Kokusho uh, would be really good in this because you get this death trigger twice. Anything with ETB triggers. I like triggers. Uh, Liza, Forgotten Archangel. Oh, yeah. Whenever yeah. another uh, non-token creature you control dies, return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. Again, maybe even Micaeus the Unhallowed, which is giving things on dying. Just, just some really cool stuff. It's also a zombie. Or you could put it into the Esper zombie deck. Yes. And now you just have another great 
white black right. zombie. And there's even a ley line in blue that makes all of your things legendary so that you can continuously loop Radadravic's token creation. Yeah. So yeah, I like that Esper inclusion. The next is uh, Wrath. Uh, I'm sorry, Rith, Liberated Primeval. So Rith, daughter of Palladium Morris, is one of the five ancient primeval dragons who ruled Dominaria sometime after the Elder Dragon War. She and her kin awoke during the previous Phyraxian invasion, but with Darigaz's death, they were sealed away once more. Darigaz recently reincarnated once again, and his psychic connection to his sister caused Rith to stir from her slumber. Freeing herself from her imprisonment, she imme- immediately took off for Shiv to unite with Darigaz. The dragon's intentions remain unclear, but Dominaria could be in serious trouble should all five primevals once again awaken. So Rith liberated primeval is a 5-5 five, five dragon for two red, green, white. And it has flying and ward two. I'm a fan of ward. I, oh, yeah. I really like it's ward. It's nice. And it says other dragons you control have ward two. Ooh, really good. And at the beginning of your end step, if a creature or planeswalker an opponent controlled was dealt excess damage this turn, create a 4-4 four, four red dragon creature token with flying. So excess damage is any damage beyond what their toughness says. It mm-hmm. doesn't have to have trample. It's just dealt more than they needed to have taken you're going to make a bunch of dragons and it makes it so that people don't want to block your dragons i like putting this in a five colors dragon deck. Mm -hmm. i also think this is just a fun commander this would be a good commander and a lot of these dragons have fire breathing anyways pay a red and get plus one plus oh so you're going to be able to create that extra damage oops i'll I'll pay one so it's at least one excess yeah i'll pay one red to get a four four dragon sounds like a pretty good trade deal All right. Well, speaking of dragons, we have Rivaz of the Claw. Rivaz of the Claw? I'm going to say Rivaz. Rivaz Rivaz is a brave and dutiful Viashino who lives among the dragons of Jumora. Centuries ago, the Viashino Zirlan forged a pact with the dragons, brokering peace between their tribes and establishing a sacred martial treaty. Rivaz is the latest in a long line of claws and is prepared to lead an army of dragons against any who dare threaten Dominaria. And that is the uh, claws as a proper noun, as a last name, claws. So, Rivaz Santa Claus. Yes, Rivaz Claws, uh, or of the claw, is a 3 3 Viachino warlock for one, a black, and a red with menace. Can tap to add two mana in any combination of colors, but spend this mana only to cast dragon creature spells. And once during each of your turns, you may cast a dragon creature spell from your graveyard. Whenever you cast a dragon creature spell from your graveyard, it gains when this creature dies, exile it. So you're not going to be able to do any loops or anything, I suppose, with Rivaz. But um, even just getting a little bit of incremental damage, uh, all of the the Kamigawa dragons in black and red are going to be super good in this. And I imagine a lot other creatures would be too. Yeah, Kolagons. We've, we've had two Kolagon in oh, the yeah. past. I've played against Kolagon the Storm's Fury. So you already have a bunch of black red dragons. Mm-hmm. Bladewing. Blade Wing the Risen and Blade Wing Deathless Tyrant. Mm-hmm. You've got your Ancient Bronze Dragon. It's just there's so many good cards. Oh, yeah. uh, this this also would just be a fun commander that it's mm-hmm. fun to see dragons in the lesser popular commanders show up. So um, there's you've got a lot if you're if you're looking to build this. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rona Shieldred's faithful, unsatisfied with her training in the Telerian Academies, the mage Rona sought out forbidden lore, eventually becoming a devotee of the ancient Phyrexian demon Gix. As an acolyte of Gix, Rona led a series of clandestine excavations deep in the caves of Koilos, searching for buried Phyrexian technology and discovered the charred but still living form of the Phyrexian praetor Shieldred. For months now, Rona has worked as Shieldred's tireless servant, preparing the way for a new invasion of Dominaria. So a 3-4 human wizard for one blue-black-black. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, each opponent loses one life. And whenever you cast Rona Shieldred's Faithful from your graveyard by discarding two cards in addition, you you may cast her from your graveyard by discarding two cards in addition to paying its other costs. So... All you have to do is just play spells. And it also says each. Each opponent loses mm-hmm. one life. So even if you only cast 10 spells, that's one quarter of your opponent's lives. Oh, yeah. And casting 10 spells in blue, black's not bad. But I also like the idea of casting copies of spells. Oh, yeah. So I think this can do a lot. And it's an unassuming commander. People won't want to remove. They're going to want to remove whatever else you put in the deck do you think you really you would really take advantage of the discarding two cards to recast this or is it more 
Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah I didn't think so. I'm gonna re I'm gonna play reanimate spells. I'd rather just use a reanimate spell than pitch two cards and yep. then cast the spell to have each of my opponents lose one. Yeah. Unless you have madness or something, I guess, built in, but then you're not casting the spells with Rona on the battlefield. So. Unless you somehow maybe windfall late game and you're like, okay. you know what? Sure. I drew three lands. Yeah. I do I definitely don't need this. I'll pitch two to cast you know that's but then rona has to be in your graveyard yeah okay well but if if rona is in your graveyard yeah. already and you're like here's the plan true then i certainly rona would. in the 99 sounds like a really good good card to have to be able to recast from your graveyard like that too so maybe it's better in the 99 than as a commander uh rose knocked i don't know if i pronounced that right heir of roga uh rose knocked comes from a long and proud line of kobolds eager to burn stab and slash their way across the mountains of the kerr ridges after reclaiming Kirkeep from her own mother, Rosnacht seeks to do what no other kobold in her lineage has done, not even her legendary ancestor Roga. Kill the draconic false god Prash and free her people from his hungry rule. Uh, so this is a 0-1 kobold warrior for one red with battle cry. So whenever this creature attacks each other attacking creature, it gets plus one, plus oh until end of turn. And heroic, whenever you cast a spell that targets Ronacht, heir of Roda... Oops, Heir of Roga, create a zero one red kobold creature token named Kobolds of Kurt. I'm glad you got this one because I would have gotten it wrong twelve <laughs> times. It's fine. It's fine. Um, I think it's a fun kobold. I like the throwback in this story yes. to defeating Prosh, which Prosh is an old precon commander mm -hmm. that when you cast it, you make a bunch of kobolds that he's going to eat. Yep, it sure does. And I didn't even know Prosh was on Dominaria, so sorry nice to have that I ate your part people. Of the flavor. <laughs> well, I don't think Prosh is sorry. Let's be honest. No, but there's a few other kobold cards that we got that i think we got a kobold in um, da, um commander legends battle for boulders gate or at least in one of the pr uh, the pre-con decks i think taunting kobold okay zero one and i'm not sure if that was even a a, a reprint I don't or, even know. or or not but um seems like a fun a fun deck i'm not sure if this is the tribal deck i build but we do have a black black red kobold that is going to come up that mm -hmm. maybe i would build if i was doing it as tribal Rulik Mons, Warren Chief, Rulik Mons, descendant of Pashlik Mons, was known to many of Dominaria's great leaders before Shildred's invasion. When Rulik Mons emerged from the Runvelt Mountains with a war band made up of nine different goblin tribes, all pledged to the banner of the coalition, they were surprised to say the least, but certainly grateful. Uh, a 3-3 three, three goblin for one red, green, green uh, with menace. And it says, whenever Rulik Mons chief attacks, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped. If you didn't, you make a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token. So you're, it's it's green, red ramp mm -hmm. in goblins. I, I like it. I don't even know if you even try top deck manipulation with this. And you're just like, man, eh, whatever I get, I get Whatever I get, I get. Sounds like a pretty goblin thing. <laughs> yeah, it does. All right. Shanid Sleeper's Scourge is our next legendary. Uh, where most people would see a quiet hamlet or a peaceful township or a remote farm, Shanid, Knight Ambassador of New Argive, sees only threats in disguise. Dispatched by Sten to uncover signs of Phyrexian sleeper agents in the Balduvian steppe, Shanid may be even more paranoid and ruthless than the man he answers to and has left a trail of burned villages behind him. A stray word or misplaced rumor has led to the scouring of entire communities in the name of securing the homeland. It has led some to wonder who the real monsters haunting the steppe are, Shildred's infiltrators or Shanid and his soldiers. Which is interesting in the story, uh, if you don't know, um, being led by Sten and Sten being even more paranoid about Shani being uh, finding sleeper agents, I think is pretty ironic. And that's where I'll just leave that <laughs> statement there. Uh, so Shani is a two, four human knight for one and Mardu red, white, black with menace. Uh, other legendary creatures you control have menace. And whenever you play a legendary land or cast a legendary spell, you draw a card and you lose one life. So good. It's a beautiful card. It is. It's a the alternate commander in the Dihada precon. Mm -hmm. So this card is very strong. I think it does exactly what you want to do in commander. I can't even suggest too many. I mean, they're all good. All the legendaries I'd play are oh, so yeah. good. Tashar Ancestor's Apostle is so good because it already cares about historic spells. Mm -hmm. Black Blade Reforged works really well if you're already playing with legendary creatures. Um I, I would play Praetors in this because mm -hmm. <laughs> they're just legendary. 
And this is my second uh, top. My This is number two on my top five cards of going into my Morophon Legendary Humans deck. It is insane in that deck. Very, very strong. Uh, Sh- uh, Shanna, Purifying Blade. So this is a Human Warrior 3-3 for green, white, and a blue that has lifelink. At the beginning of your end step, you may pay X. If you do draw X cards, X cannot be greater than the amount of life you gained. So Shanna is a descendant of the Weather Lights Captain Sisse and a capable hero in her own right. When Joyer gave up control of the ship, Shanna took the, on the role as captain and has led the crew on countless adventures since then. She and the rest of those on board the Weather Light now sail into territory controlled by Shieldred's forces, smuggling out precious information and supplies um i'm not a fan of of just life life gain decks in general and bant just i haven't i haven't quite gotten there yet sure i haven't quite gotten there yet but i have seen this played on some cedh competitive streams okay um because you can you can just draw cards here by paying life Mm -hmm. um but you do have to have gained it. So it's it's pretty cool. I, I think Shanna just works if you're just playing a generic life gain deck too. Yeah, just throw in some Soul Sisters and go to town. Really good. Uh, Shieldred, the Apocalypse is the next one. We did talk about this on our combo episode. Uh, so first, among the steel thanes that rule the dross pits of New Phyrexia, Shieldred has been sent to Dominaria with a single purpose. Weaken the plane by any and all methods at her disposal and destroy any threats to New Phyrexian's reign. Already, she has placed her agents in positions of influence across the plane. Now, Shieldred hunts for anything that might prevent her total victory, and Karn and his Silex are at the top of her list. And you should read episode five and find out what happened with Karn and the Silex and Shieldred. Um, but yeah, we talked about Shieldred already in the combo episode, so make sure you, you check out the combo episode if you want to know all about Shieldred. Yeah, Solkanar the Tainted. Solkanar is an ancient demon, king of Corindor. Uh, once a kind nature spirit, he was corrupted by the insidious planeswalker Gaedron Dihada. Millennia of dark magic have left him so twisted he no longer wishes to return to his original form. He works with Dihada to eliminate the last traces of the Carthalian bloodline and currently sits upon their ancestral throne of Corindor. So it's a 5 5 elemental demon for two blue, black, red. At the beginning of your end step, choose one that hasn't been chosen. You can draw a card. You can have each opponent lose two life and you gain two life. Or Soul Canar the Tainted deals three damage to up to one other target creature or planeswalker. Or finally, exile Soul Canar, then return it to the battlefield under an opponent's control. Mm-hmm. So, uh, very fun flicker deck. Uh, if you want to go ahead and blink it and choose some options over giving your commander away to one of your opponents. Mm-hmm. Um, and Sol Kanar, the original one, is um, a card that I've seen in commander only a few times, but it's true. It, it, it does do some work. Yeah. Don't forget about your homeward path. You're the land that makes it so you can gain control of all the cards you own in case you can't blink it in time yes uh, soul of wind grace uh which is the uh son of wind grace no i think it's wind grace itself <laughs> lord wind grace was a powerful planeswalker and a member of the nine titans that urza assembled to battle phyrexia which you can see in the in the uh uh, leg or the oh my gosh the saga card uh, urza assembles the titans uh, several conflicts later wind grace gave his life to save his homeland of urborn from a deadly time rift as he disappeared he cast a spell to fuse his spirit with the land to watch over it always with the return of the phyrexians wind grace's magic stirs ready to protect urborg once more so you get a 5-4 cat avatar for one and jund, one black, red, green. It says whenever Soul Wind Grace enters the battlefield or attacks, you may put a land card from a graveyard on, from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. Then has three activated abilities for a green and discard a land, you can gain three life. For one and a red and discard a land, you get to draw a card. And for two and a black and discard a land, uh, Soul of Wind Grace gains indestructible until end of turn and tap it. I know someone in our in our Discord is building this right now. I'm excited to see it. A lot of people were excited to see something new for Jund and Lands Matter. So uh, I know I'm putting this in my Henzi Toolbox deck for other reasons. This but... made it onto the Command Zone. So if you didn't oh, yeah. watch the most recent Command Zone episode, you can check out a Soul of Wind Grace deck there. I I it just works with lands oh yeah whatever land things you want to do get lands back life from the loam Mm -hmm. if you want to discard lands to give creatures you know whatever steal your opponent's lands if you're for some reason running domain and you need more domain sylvan safekeeper to return a land to your hand to give it shroud and then discard a land to do the other things Mm -hmm. so much you can do here next is squee dubious monarch once a captain boy on the weatherlight a mishap related to an evil god 
granted squeak immortality. Unable to die by blade, age, or any other method his assorted enemies have tried, Squee has had his fill of adventuring and now lives in retirement as the chieftain of a goblin tribe high in the Otarian Mountains. Lately, he can't shake the feeling that something is off and he's putting his centuries of wisdom uh, to the purpose of figuring out just what that something is. So a 2-2 goblin noble for two and, a, two and a red. Haste. Whenever it attacks, you make a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking. And then you can cast We Dubious Monarch from exile. Uh, I'm sorry, from your graveyard by paying three and a red and exiling four of the cards from your graveyard rather than paying their mana cost. So it very much feels like escape four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he has escape four and also uh, pay four. Um, great card. It fits in with the exact things that Squee used to do. But if you're looking for one that just like sacrifices that you can just like sack and return, I'm I'm not thinking this is the one. I think this wants to go in a more generic uh, goblin deck where the yes. others want to go in a more sacrifice heavy deck. Agreed. And if you're not, uh, uh, if you didn't know about the even more lore behind this between Squee and Urtai, um, Urtai is, is one of the people that was the most interested in Squee's undying ability and killed Squee over and over and over and over. Oh, and over. poor Squee. Yeah, poor Squee. All right, Sten Paranoid Partisan, the heir to a long and prestigious noble Argivian lineage, Sten has chosen by King Darien himself for a solemn task, root out the Phyrexian agents within New Argive by any means necessary. Ironic. Sten pursues his quarry with ruthless efficiency and total dedication, stopping at nothing to do the bidding of his master. Uh, so Sten is a human wizard 2-2 two -two for a white and a blue. Uh, this is when Sten enters the battlefield. Choose a card type other than creature or land. Spells you cast of the chosen type cost one generic class to cast. And for one, a white and a blue, you can exile Sten and return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step, allowing you to name a different card type or the same card type just to protect Sten. Um, it's I'm, fun to reset it to something else too. Yeah, I, we talked about Sten as potentially like a new Planeswalker uh, commander or something like that. So Yeah, you said you were thinking about potentially switching it out in the in your gideon commander my, my deck. Jiru deck. your jiru yes. deck yes mm -hmm. and it's a jiru but with there's so many gideons there's lots of just gideons. mono white That's walkers <laughs> but now it's blue white pipes exactly walkers. next is tatiova steward of tides tatiova is a trained druid attuned to both the tides and the coastal forests of dominaria after completing her training with the elves of yavamaya she returned to her home in the undersea empire of vidalia she has been instrumental in tempering emperor mihail ii's more martial impulses and strives to build a more folk society that can serve as defenders of the natural world so a 3-3 merfolk druid for green green blue land creatures you control have flying and whenever land enters the battlefield under your control if you control seven or more lands up to one target land you control becomes a 3-3 elemental with haste it's still a land so i talked about wanting to build this i like this with any ramp that you have you're in green now so you can get out a ton of lands and then scape shift, you can have it so that all your lands at the same time turn into three threes with haste. They all have flying, so it makes it very difficult for your opponents to block them. You know, it's you could play stuff. coat of arms because they're okay. all elementals. So you could just kind of win off of that because they become elemental creatures. So yeah, go to town. Tatiova is going to be a fun commander when you run into it. The one thing I'm confused about here is how Tatiova trained with the elves of Yavi Maya. There must be an inlet river or lake or something because Tatiova doesn't have legs. Maybe Tatiova turned a bunch of land into <laughs> flying <laughs> elementals and had them fly her there. That would be really cool to see. <laughs> All right, the Peregrine Dynamo is another card we did talk about on our combos episode. Uh, Urza Mechanical... Urza mechanical soldiers have been dormant for countless years. However, the Thran technology that fueled them was sound, and sometimes all it takes is a mountain goat's misstep to reactivate a millennia-old war machine. Joya found the Peregrine Dynamo stomping across the countryside, shouting, Do not be alarmed! at wildlife. A few artificer tricks later, she had recruited a stalwart new ally. He's just screaming, Don't be alarmed, everyone! It, it really reminds me of most of the robots in the Fallout video game series that are like still <laughs> in their auto loops or of whatever they were doing before the apocalypse happened yeah do not be alarmed do not be alarmed but it this is this has a lot of combo potential it's huge very very i cool. haven't looked into it as a colorless deck with it at the helm but i assume it works pretty well yeah the next card is is pretty cool a story that everybody wanted to hear about for so long so, the raven man a mysterious figure 
Always heralded by the arrival of ravens, the Raven Man has haunted Liliana Vest since childhood. He has appeared to her on planes throughout the multiverse, and while others can see the flock that accompanies him, Liliana remains the only one who can see him in the flesh. Whether he is friend or foe remains to be seen, but Liliana intends to discover the truth behind this enigmatic figure, a truth rooted in powerful necromancer uh, from Tercier's ancient past. So the Raven Man is a 2-1 human wizard for one and a black at the beginning of each end step. A play if a player discarded a card this turn, you make a 1-1 black bird creature token of flying. And it has this creature can't block. And you can pay three and a black and tap it. Each opponent discards a card, activate only as a sorcery. I I think it's fun um, to build if you wanted to build like the crows, the crowning. Again, we're talking about Moira from Shit's Creek. Okay, <laughs> honestly, we just want to talk about Shit's Creek this episode. Um, it fits really well into Tiny Bones. I'm not sure discarding cards is a very popular strategy to play with your friends. Right. But if if everybody's going into it understanding, hey, I want to play this discard deck, mm -hmm. uh, you know then plan accordingly. But I think it's a fun deck and it, it does something different that we've not seen before. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Tori de Avenant Fury Rider. Tori was born with a degenerative, de degenerative disease, rare but not er, her, unheard of to royalty of the Avenant line. By the time she was a teenager, she had lost the use of her legs entirely. While this somewhat complicated her training as a cavalry officer, it hardly stopped her. Now with a specially trained war horse and a custom saddle, Tori rides into battle at the head of the Avenant Fury Riders. She is known especially for her fearlessness in battle, never flinching from a line of enemy spears. So this is a 3-3 human knight that costs one red, red, white with vigilance and trample. It says whenever Tori... Uh, attacks all other attacking creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn other red attacking creatures you control gain trample until end of turn uh, and untap each other white attacking creature you control so pseudo vigilance for your uh, uh white creatures there um i like this i really love the flavor uh, of this particular uh commander having lost the use of her legs and still is able to ride uh into war um i do think there's a little bit of a concern if her horse ever dies uh, or gets killed or something. Uh oh, it's like a Treyu in. Is it a Treyu? No, a Artemis. Treyu. Is it a Treyu or is that Artemis? I can't remember it from the Neverending Story. A Treyu. It's a Treyu. Well, no, a Treyu is the is the giant dog dragon. Yeah. No. Then it's Ar Artemis. Yeah. Right? He's trying to the, get out of the bog out of, of the, sadness the, or whatever. The, the sadness. Yeah. Ugh. I don't. I've only seen that scene. I don't think I've ever seen like that movie. In that movie is really good. I've seen yeah. it a lot of times. There's a lot of weird names. I can't yeah. remember it now, but this card wants, this deck wants like assemble the Legion. Oh yeah. Adriana, captain of the guard. You just want to swing a bunch of creatures and just make them as large as you can. Well, and especially bonus if they're both red and white. If they're both red and white. Next is Tura. And I think this is uh, pronounced Kenarud Sky Knight. I'm not sure how I think that. That's right. I think a, a, a U with umlauts on it is pronounced U, so I think yeah. you're good. Tura Kinnerud Sky Knight. So Tura Kinnerud is the scion of a long lineage of Argivian Sky Knights. Her family line stretches all the way back to Keljor during the Dominarian Ice Age when they nurtured an Asir breed that could thrive in a warmer climate. When she came of age, Tura was given her own Asir to ride and train. A direct descendant of the an the animal Arna Kinnerud once rode into battle. Now the pair are a deadly duo, able to communicate wordlessly and and fight perfectly in sync. Tarud was among the first to join the new coalition, eager to prove that she is more than just the latest child of a storied family. So Turrican Arud is a 3-3 human knight for two white, blue, blue, flying, and it has whenever you cast an instant sorcery spell, you make a one on white soldier creature token. So um, I'm not sure... I mean, this fits really well into any deck that's already playing like Talrand. So if you're sure. playing blue-white tokens... Go for it. Yeah, we just talked about Raph uh, earlier in this. This fits really well into Raph. You get to make creatures every time you cast an instant or sorcery spell, and then you get to tap your creatures to draw cards. It also feels very much like this is like how to train your dragon. Oh, yeah. And but how to train your, what is it? Your bird. Bird. Yeah, that's your what warm, we call it a bird. Your, your, your fair weather bird. Yes. Your warm, warm weather birds. All right. Let's talk about frogs then next, since we talked about birds a little bit. Erg, spawn of Turg. Uh, when Turg, the mighty frog beast, bonded to the merfolk ambassador to the Cabal, 
perished, he left behind a clutch of eggs. While the Cabal attended to use these to create more hulking pit fighters, one of the tadpoles escaped their control. Now Urg, a specimen as mighty as Turg himself, freely roams the lands of Wataria, eating whomever he pleases. So you get a star five frog beast for black, black, green that says uh, Urg's power is equal to the number of land cards in your graveyard. And at the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. You may put that card into your graveyard and an activated ability of a black and a green to sacrifice a land and you gain two life. Um, so it, it is kind of, I think, costs a little bit to, to sacrifice that land to gain that two life, but at least it does put a land in your graveyard and makes Urg bigger. You can do combat tricks just by swinging, sack all your lands, and maybe Urg's big enough to... to and it's, it's it's risky to sack all your but lands. But it's going to happen. And then you can just like Splendid Reclamation all of them back or something. Yeah, that's It's it's a fun plan. And the name is Urg. Urg. Spawn of Turg. <laughs> uh, the next is Varric, Warps and Jeers. So while Baron has not set foot on Dominaria for millennia, his vile Osprey Spring remained. Varric was sired many generations after Baron, so he is twisted and monstrous as a result. Normally a being of pure instinct and hunger, Varric is occasionally visited by bouts of clarity. In those moments, he could atone for his actions, but instead he uses this lucidity to plan his next kill. So a 2-2 vampire for one white and a black, flying death touch lifelink. When you activate an ability that isn't a man ability, if life was paid to activate it, you may pay that much life again. If you do copy that ability, you may choose new targets. So you talked about potentially wanting to add this to a deck or building a deck with it. I'm, it I'm really works. It. it really works with fetch lands, which mm -hmm. is what everybody was very uh, really, like hot on during preview season. So you can sacrifice fetch land, lose a life, pay another life. You duplicate that. So that that's cool. But if you can just find a bunch of things that require you to pay life to activate them, you just do them all double. I got to talk to a judge about whether Phyrexian mana counts as paying life to activate an ability, even if you override the Phyrexian mana, um, like with uh, uh, Curic, Son of Yawgmoth or something, because that could just take the deck to a whole new level. Gross. Vohar, Vodalian Desecrator, a would-be usurper of Vodalia, Vohar sought to seize control of the Empire from Mihail II and led the Merfolk in a campaign of bloodshed and glory against the surface world. When his traitorous plot was discovered, Vohar was banished to the abyssal layer of Dominaria's oceans. In exile, he encountered an ancient Phyrexian on the seafloor, awoken by Shieldred's incursion. Completed, Vohar still seeks the, the destruction of Milhel for the glory of new Phyrexia. So you get a Phyrexian Merfolk wizard one two for blue and a black it has an activability of tap draw a card then discard a card if you discarded an instant or sorcery card this way each opponent loses one life and you gain one life you can pay two generic mana to sacrifice vohar you may cast target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard this turn if that spell would be put into your graveyard exile it instead activate only as a sorcery so blue black uh just spell slinger um but also you i guess you get to filter Instant and sorceries from your hand, maybe flashback. I like the idea of like Gale Waterdeep Prodigy because oh, sure. you can cast an instant, so you can get a sorcery to cast in your graveyard. Mm -hmm. Patriarch Seal, or again like Thousand Year Elixir to untap your creatures to do to do more stuff. I think this works really well yeah. with a lot of uh, Leer Disciple of the Drowned. That way, you actually can discard it and still cast it for the same cost as it would from your hand or something. Yeah, very. It, it's it's a lot of good stuff, and I will say, taking a look, I had looked at EDA Drex page for this one before, and it looks like a lot of competitive deck have been built just it's based fair. on on the cards you see there's like dramatic reversals and things yeah, like that big so. dramatic reversal lines here yeah, it, yeah. so next is zaro hanan scion of afrava so if um afrava once a verdant oasis in the midst of the jamur desert is no more gone to a nameless calamity of the past the the leonian that once inhabited this land are far from extinct though while many have scattered to the far corners of dominaria zaro hanan a descendant of the fearsome mercenary jedi ohanan is uh, now leads a caravan of Afravans as they travel through Jumura. Zar's heart is devoted to guiding and protecting her people, and she is as capable a warrior as her ancestor, more willing to cross blades with any who threaten her caravan. So for three, a green and a white, you get a 4-4 four, four cat warrior with domain. Whenever uh, Zar O'Hanan a uh, becomes tapped put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control with toughness less than the number of basic land types among lands you control so if uh you know again prismatic omen it's another green domain commander you're going to put counters on almost all of your creatures then as long as their uh toughness is less than five at least in that case right. it might be very tough if you aren't running like prismatic omen or don't run into that because you're really only going to put counters then on one ones right because it has to be less than. And if yeah. you have a, a, a plains and a forest, now it's two. 
hopefully there's ways uh, and i don't see it on edhrex page to like remove plus one plus one counters from your creatures so that you can activate it again but then somehow get some sort of power counter remove that. a remove a counter from something and then you can either put a counter on something else there are cards that you can right. at least move them around right so maybe you can take advantage of that yeah. um, and if you thought we were almost done because we were in the z's well we have two more to go here <laughs> zarium golden wind when zolfir was phased out of the, of the time stream by the planeswalker to fairy most of the griffins that hunted those savannah skies went with it zarium a descendant of the legendary griffin zuberi because we all know zuberi is one of the few remaining members of the species proud and haughty zarium is known to spare travelers who pass through their territory but poachers in search of griffin pelts meet quick ends so this is our griffin uh commander so a three four griffin for three and a white with flying it says whenever a griffin you control deals combat damage to a player create a two two white griffin creature token with flying so tokens flying griffins probably going to be playing some changelings to fill out the rest of those creatures honestly this is just a silly deck that i can't wait to play against yeah. and if i have to put it together just so that i can see it i'm gonna do it It'd be really cool just in a changeling tribal deck though too so changing tribal decks are good and and they are fine and the changings that we have available now in colorless do work they're oh, not yeah. just bad filler cards no, some of them not. are real good yeah universal automaton is one of the best changeling one generic mana fits in every deck fits in every deck and we are on our very last legendary we were going through this whole episode we weren't gonna stop so <laughs> we appreciate that you're all still here and this is gruntilda from banjo kazooie and if you played that game you will know who i'm talking about sorry you didn't play banjo kazooie okay very good game on the nintendo 64 mm -hmm. but the 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 witch the for the character the the witch is gruntilda and that's what zur eternal schemer looks like to me it's all i see is gruntilda all right so zur the enchanter uh or i'm sorry zur eternal schemer has spent the last dozen centuries doing whatever the heck he wants after freeing himself from all earthly responsibilities the immortal wizard traveled the plane in searching in search of meaning recently he reappeared before joda asking for a job he just wants a job just want a job okay now a professor at the Tolarian academy he swears he just wants to quote foster knowledge in the minds of the young and is quote definitely not up to anything joda is keeping an eye on him of course I, this story is very funny. Yeah, it is. Uh, so Zur is a 1-4 human wizard for white, blue, black with flying. And it says enchantment creatures you control have death touch, lifelink, and hex proof. And has pay one and a white target non-aura enchantment you control. Becomes a creature in addition to its other types and has base power and base toughness equal to its mana value so you know i was not very happy seeing this card when it when it was preview but honestly it reminds me of starfield of nyx sure um it also reminds me of what you can do with um creatures that are equipped when you're playing the other esper commander that can make equipment into creatures sidri because you can, oh, uh, you sure. essentially, if you turn them into a creature, it unequips it. In this case, you can turn a, a, a is this a, it does say. Non-aura. A non-aura. So it can't unequip. Right. So it can't unequip. Right. Because it's non-aura. But you could, I mean, it could be an enchantment like Solemnity or something. It's preventing people from getting counters. And maybe when you want to get counters, you could turn into a creature and sacrifice it or something like that. Hallowed Haunting which can then just become a creature. Sigil the Empty Throne yeah. becoming a creature. My Sphere of Safety becoming a 5-5 five five that also Ooh. has that ability is very good. I, I'm not sure I would I would build this myself, but I can certainly see how strong this would be because it's they stay enchantments. Yes, they do. I mean, and you can... The thing is here is you want the enchantments to be really high mana value, and maybe that's why, because it gets power and toughness equal to its mana value. So you're going to have to do some sort of like cheating out of your graveyard strategy. But or it something. does have death touch lifelink and hex proof. Yeah, it's pretty good. That's really good because the risk before of turning things into creatures was that they could just easily be removed. And you're right. like, crap, I don't, I didn't expect that. I didn't mm -hmm. want that. But this gives them some protection. I you like it a lot. Just got to look out for that arcane lighthouse that'll remove hex proof and then you're good to go. As long as that's not on the battlefield, you're good to go. And, and I think I'm the only person who really plays that. <laughs> yeah, I so think so too. I don't think anyone's really going to have to worry <laughs> about that but that's gonna be it for this week we got through all of those legendaries and we hope you learned something new because i learned a lot about the backstories of some of these Tons. creatures i didn't know what most of them did. <laughs> agreed <laughs> <laughs> so um 
you know, we're going to actually keep new card hype going next week yeah, we because are. we're going to be discussing cards that we like from the new Warhammer 40k Commander deck. I don't know if we have enough time to talk about all the cards we like. Or... They've only re revealed one deck so far according to the time that we're recording now. There's already so many cards I love. There's, there's a lot of really good cards. So stay tuned and come back next week because we're going to talk all about some more new cards. But until then, if you would like to chat with me online, you can find me on Twitter at Andy Flory. And you can find me on Twitter at Wormcorn Engine. And we just want to thank you all for listening. If you made it all the way to the end of this episode, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll talk to you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>